Um, but I'll just go ahead and kick us off. Thank you all so much for being here with us tonight. Um, as I'm sure you know from all the, the neon green in the room, um, we are Star Service and Study Abroad, a service learning program to Ghana. And of course, that's what we're going to be talking about a bit about tonight. Um, so myself, I am Nialina Ali. I'm the co-founder, co-director of Star Service and Study Abroad. Um, I'm originally from Oakland, California, and my background is in international studies, Africana studies, and I'm also a Juris Doctor candidate. And how about you? Oh, yeah, me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so my name is Brittany, uh, the other half of Star Service and Study Abroad, and I have my undergrad in anthropology and applied masters, applied anthropology masters. And I'm working on my dissertation right now, also in anthropology. And a lot of the things that you guys mentioned definitely overlap with some of my own interests. So as an applied anthropologist, I've looked into things like colonialism and uh, medical anthropology was my focus, which ties in well with the public health and the global health. So yes, that's a little bit. And then uh, if I have to Put a, another screen on. It's my ten-year-old daughter that's at home, <laughs> wanting to all of our be a part of this. So, <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. So it's so cool to hear all the different interests in the room, and I think that's one thing I know I really appreciate about our program and what we do, and how um, all the different perspectives that we bring into the classroom already here in our information session, but it's really cool when we see it actually in action and gone on seeing all the different ways your majors and interests really intersect and overlap with one another. Um, and so with that said, now that we know a little bit more about each of you, we're going to go on ahead to talk a little bit more about us. So we're clicking in two places here. All right. So a little bit about us. So again, um, I'm Mia, this is Brittany. Um, we're both by college base. I'm actually a Mount Holyoke alumna myself. I think there's a Smithy in the room, right? Um, but we're all five college families, right? <laughs> and so, um, yeah, and I think we already set ourselves enough in the introductions um, because I think I'm going to just tie it over to why we started SSSA because I'll tell you a lot more about who we are. Um, so really, why we created Star Service and Study Abroad, um, we can't start this info session without speaking to our origin story because it's also interconnected in what brings us here today. Um, so I will do it in a nutshell and let me know if I got anything wrong, but I'll try to keep it really short. Um, so essentially, Brittany and I had actually met, we were in a Chui class, which is one of the national languages of Ghana um, that they offer through the Five College Center for the Study of World Languages, a really long acronym. <laughs> And so um, we were both met in the Shui class. We were the only person, so out of the tens of thousands of people and students in the Valley who could have taken the class, it was just the two of us. Um, Brittany had just returned from being in Ghana doing research, which I'm not even going to attempt to try to, to try to capture in a little nutshell, but she had been doing research with an organization in Ghana. And when we met, she was talking about how while she was there, um, there was a lot of people who were volunteers, undergraduate students, who were really coming to her and relying on her for some type of mentorship. And she was thinking, if only they could have had some type of pre-departure training or orientation before they came, because the questions they had really should have been answered before they got there, right? And, so, and then if you're trying to do this work, but you have these really basic or fundamental questions, then maybe you're not that qualified or prepared to really do the work that you're volunteering on. And so when she mentioned this, um, it immediately resonated with me because through my own travel experiences, I had seen how ill-prepared people can be when going abroad and how much of a conflict that can cause. Um, I always share one anecdote of there was a time I was with the U.S. Department of State. I was in Turkey. I was a participant in one of their programs. And we just got off the plane, and I was at my security briefing with the U.S. Embassy in Ankara, Turkey. And they asked if we had any questions. And I was the only person of color in my group. And I asked um, about anti-blackness in Turkey and my safety. I'm in a new country. I know there's parts of my own country that I want to know about you know, safety precautions. 
And I'm in the embassy, it's the security briefing. So I thought this is a really great place to know if there's any hate groups going on or anything I should be aware of. Um, I got absolute crickets. <laughs> I made everyone really uncomfortable and it was crickets. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, this is kind of the place where you should really be able to get that information. So then there's also the question when you think of preparedness, but also like diversity and study abroad, there's just this really huge joy through our conversations that we were both able to identify through our own travels. And so we created Star Service and Study Abroad to try to fill that void. And so our approach is really um, recognizing, putting service learning together. So, so often, I know some of you mentioned that you've studied abroad. Um, show of hands out of curiosity, has anyone volunteered abroad before? Yeah? It was like a service. Nice. And what about volunteering in your own community? Yeah, it's probably just good to kind of see um, what, you know, what you've all been up to before you got here. Um, and so we put the two together because we find often, especially when it comes to international volunteering opportunities, you have people who are in a foreign country to help people, but they're not really learning anything about structures, systems, politics, culture, history. I mean, the list can be so long. So how helpful can you really be if you don't know the larger societal context? And then if you take it to the other side where you have study abroad, often people go to study in other countries, but that often puts you with a very specific demographic of people, just as we see on many college campuses here, so um, already class-wise, you might be with a more privileged group of people, and you also might be with people of a similar age. Just very generally speaking, um, but often in study abroad, you're seeing a very narrow view into a country, right? You're not with people of all different ages or all different backgrounds. So when you put the two together, you can be more informed and more capable and helpful to actually make meaningful contributions to another community. So we are, that's our solution to a lot of what we saw, which is putting the two together. And so um, we're gonna talk a little bit more about our service component and then our study component. Would you like to take us away? Sure. <laughs> All right, so uh, I started going to Ghana in 2016 after a couple of years of having conversations with um, Eric Ajiman, who Becky got to meet, and he uh, is a co-director of an organization in Ghana called the Triple Hearts Foundation. And so I was in the process of doing my applied uh, master's degree, and I had to do some sort of internship for that. Uh, and it only had to be for a summer. And it was, you know, it was 2013, my first year of grad school. I really wanted to do something related to medical anthropology and global health. Uh, and I really wanted to do something where it was really grassroots focused uh, with putting band-aids on problems, but also trying to do some sort of advocacy and systems change. And so I did a whole semester research project on NGOs uh, from the United States, South America, and the continent of Africa. And so I narrowed my search down, had all these conversations with a host of different um, uh, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, and Eric and I ended up having two years worth of conversation, and I finally ended up having the funding, and the project design, and all of these things to pilot uh, once I got to UMass. And so I finally got to meet him in 2016, where I met a ton of volunteers from the US and Europe who were dealing with a lot of culture shock. Eric was wanting them to do a bunch of surveys and interviews, you know, very qualitative and also some quantitative data analysis. And they're like, I don't know what to do. Like they're 18, 19, 20. Like they hadn't had any research classes as undergrads yet, sophomores and juniors, you know, so I was helping them a lot uh, with all of these different things, navigating taxi drivers and money and you know, just all this stuff. And I was just there to do a pilot study. And so, that's sort of how I got started. So just to say this public health project, this education project and this STEM project come from years of conversation, of uh, relationship building, and it's all led by Ghanaians already doing the work. All right, so these are not projects that were our ideas at all. Uh, we don't work directly with Triple Hearts anymore. They're going through growing pains, as nonprofits do, uh, reorganizing and restructuring their stuff. Uh, but 
we still work with people within their network and in their circles. So to start, the Public Health Project. Is that the first one? It is. Yes. Great. The Public Health Project. All right. So yeah. She, here in this picture, used to be a member of the Cheerful Hearts Foundation, and she since has moved from the Accra region, uh, in the central region, to uh, Kumasi, all right? And then her friend, Mamle, also worked for Cheerful Hearts, and she has started her own business and also her own nonprofit that's geared towards specifically helping young women. Right, and so um, this coming year, they're doing a lot of things around sanitation and recycling uh, from a public health perspective. Also teaching about sexual health and reproductive health. All right, so last year, some of the volunteers that we took with us did a whole uh, inter-school intra uh, Jeopardy, and they made it really fun and interactive. The kids had a ton of fun. Uh, they did some health surveys, but it was mostly related to piloting this whole sanitation and recycling project. Uh, entry data, we do a little bit less of that right now. There's not as big of a research component. Uh, however, that is always subject to change. And then support and assistance wherever needed. So Momle and Ya constantly have different things. There's a lot of moving parts when you have a nonprofit. And so part of the roles of the SSSA students is to work directly with us uh, to give the organization what they need. And if you don't have the skill, we can help build those skills one-on-one -on -one so you're not a drain on the organization, right? So we make sure that everyone can workshop things and then go to work prepared, okay? So public health in a nutshell. Then we have the education project. So Padmore here. Uh, is a really good friend. Hi, come on in. You guys can get some pizza. We're just talking about projects. Uh, so Pat Warner is a good friend of mine. I started talking to him around the same time that I started talking to Eric. So 2014 or so, I started talking to Pat Moore. He also has worked with um, the Triple Hearts Foundation, but he has his own organization called the Campaign for Learning Differences. He used to be the Campaign for Learning Disabilities. And they work to help children with learning differences. Uh, so that could be um, being on the uh, autism spectrum, definitely with reading and dyslexia uh, issues. Um, oh, thanks. <laughs> and, sorry, and I will just say too, these are the bullet points or things that people have done in past years, so it's also what it could look like. Right. But as Brittany's already stated, we are there to meet the needs of the current org. We're not coming to implement our own goals and agenda. So these are all possibilities. These are what students have done in the past. And so just to give an idea. Yeah, sure. Um, so he has his own nonprofit, all right? And so we work with him now in the Coswa area. Uh, so if you were on the education project, that could look like, uh, well, it'll especially look like working alongside grade school teachers. So oftentimes what you'll find in the schools is there's, you know, 40 to 50 students, very crammed, and there's not always a lot of uh, resources for people who are maybe slower or needing special attention. Uh, and there's a lack of systems and infrastructure uh, especially in the more rural areas for, for people who aren't just going to get it right away. All right, so that's when the Campaign for Learning Disabilities comes in and their staff, their local volunteers, and then also international volunteers will go train teachers and sort of show them these uh, different teaching methodologies and tools to help the students who need that extra assistance, okay? Um, let's see here, tutoring and homework help. So the Campaign for Learning Disabilities or Differences, they also work directly with parents to sort of give those, what do they call that here? The in learning education, plan. The learning plans. This, um, I, I individual, what does that stand for? Education. Plans. Individual education plans. Yeah, so they, they've started implementing those, I don't know, I think five or six years ago, through this organization. You know, and then the, the Ghana Education Service is also starting to pick up on these things. And so you can start to see the system changes and increase in infrastructure and things. So there's that advocacy part that's really important as well. Okay. Oh, and then 
This will be our second year doing STEM. Do you guys work with, you two were doing engineering. Do you guys work with Nathaniel? Lamping. Lamping. Yeah. yeah. You know him? Yeah. Do you guys work with him? He's in the engineering. We he's know the school this year. But he's it's okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, <laughs> all right. So this picture here is Nathaniel, and he'll be coming back later to to talk a little bit about his experience last year. So he kicked off the pilot for the STEM program last year, and so Yah, who was in that first picture, like I said, she's in Kumasi now doing some other things, and she works with um, Charles and Michael at a place called Dext Industries. And they were born and raised in Ghana, went to university in Ghana, and they've created these kits to learn all about circuits and a lot of she did a lot of the training. <laughs> <laughs> Outside of both of our expertise, but Mia and Nathaniel got down and dirty and did all of the different lessons. How many were there? Twenty? No, I think there's about 36 or more. 36 or more. Yeah. And it's just these small kits here. And you do all these different exercises. And so it's funny because this is like <laughs> not a part of our daily vocabulary at no. all. But having been, this is actually a photo I took of Nathaniel and Michael, one of the founders of Dextech who um, during a training session, so some of the things I know there's resistors and capacitors and there's projects that can produce light and sound. And so it's like a lot of basic fundamental concepts related to STEM and engineering, but through this kit, which is accessible, relatively affordable, and you can see like all these little components in that black case that are just very well put together through this single kit, a child can have this entire huge classroom experience learning. And it was actually interesting too, working with Nathaniel, he's studying engineering here at UMass in university. And it was, he was even saying it was helping him gain a deeper understanding of things he's learning in class now. So it can help with that understanding through different ages. You know, it's a simple tool with a lot of applications. And I learned a lot, even though I can't recite it all. <laughs> right. So Nathaniel was great to have on board because at least that was part of his lingo. <laughs> exactly. Um, and, you know, of course, we were learning and studying, I should say, more Mia than myself because I was handling some of the other things. But uh, so if you come and you're a part of that STEM team, uh, what Ya and Momle have both done is sort of take this nonprofit model, this outreach and advocacy model, and taken this business with with Dext Technologies, so to bring these affordable resources to schools and then to do the hands-on training so that the teachers then can do the lessons once the volunteers leave, all right, which is a whole conversation around volunteerism that we get into at some point. All right, so if you're here, you're going to be doing uh, the science set training directly with Michael. Uh, you'll be teaching and working with the educators, the science teachers. You'll be helping with the curriculum development. So there's already lesson plans for these. But of course, you know, if you have ideas to make it more engaging or something that works well for you, that's something that you can do um, while you're there. Collaboration and logistics. We're going to help you have spreadsheets and figure out how to organize with multiple teachers at multiple schools and get these calendars and all of these things situated uh, so that it runs smoothly. So all of you at some point are going to have a little bit of um, research or program design, right? That'll help you uh, in school and in any other projects you do in the future. And then monitoring and evaluation, uh, Michael at Dext Technologies would really like to hear from the teachers, the volunteers, and the students who are working in the classroom uh, what works well and what doesn't work well because they're wanting to constantly improve these. They've gotten some contracts in Europe, like million dollar contracts, to send these sets to schools uh, in other countries. And so they're always constantly wanting to be mindful of their product. Okay, so that'll be um, something that will be happening this summer. Yeah. So with other interests, uh, we're open to all majors. And as an applied anthropologist, I can take any of your guys' interests, journalism, global health, uh, what were some of the others doing? 
forgot how to do a lot of education. Education, colonialism for sure, anthropology, STEM, uh, but we can really work with you if you have an idea. Uh, you can submit a proposal for, you know, an alternative project, you know, when you apply with us. We'll work with our partners to see if it's feasible, all right? But part of the conversation that we have is thinking through our projects, like, are we sure we can go to another place with a new idea? Mm -hmm. You know, so we'll help work backward and sort of see what the sustainability and feasibility of your idea is, but we'll, we'll keep in conversation throughout the entire process. And you won't necessarily be shot down, but we'll, we'll work with you on, on the design. And I think the STEM project with Nathaniel is an yeah. example of that. Yeah. Yeah. And so he had initially come to us with a very um, what's the word? ambitious project idea um, that wouldn't have been feasible for the time we were there. Um, and wouldn't have exactly aligned with our values of sustainability and mentorship and different things, but it was STEM related. And so we reached out to our network and we had Yah and Kumasi who was working with Dex Technologies. We thought this is something really awesome and we already have people doing education and that's something that can be expanded and sustainable. And so he kind of launched that. So it's a good example of how present us with your ideas. We love ideas. And then again, like Brittany said, we can work backwards and oftentimes find something that's mutually beneficial and ideal. Yes. All right, so for the study component, um, so I'm a PhD student here at UMass. I already teach intro to anthropology classes. Uh, I've been teaching for quite a few years in different capacities. I also did a study abroad in South Africa, and I did some training and teaching there as well. Uh, and so it's really important to me that students and professionals kind of wish some people with the UN would take classes like this and be aware <laughs> of some of these things. One they're they're catching up. up. They're, they're getting there. there. <laughs> um, but anyways, and it, uh, anyway, so <laughs> needless to say, we, we do have a classroom component. Okay, so I've, I've designed a curriculum based on different service learning and anthropology classes that I've taken. Uh, and we will be working through a critical race lens and a post-colonialism colonialism, post -colonial lens. Words. So many variations. Uh, and so what we'll be doing is thinking about our own identities within the classroom, within Ghana, and within the United States. All right, we're going to peel back layers, think about our own socialization, uh, where we fit in. We're going to talk about the day-to-day -day experiences in Ghana. All right, uh, men and women are gonna have different experiences. Uh, women of color, specifically um, thinking about uh, women from African descent versus women with white skin. You're all, there's all sorts of different experiences that are gonna happen. So that will be a part of the classroom conversation. Uh, we will talk about Ghana before colonialism, during colonialism, and after colonialism, and the legacies that are still uh, very visceral and apparent uh, related to that. We will critique development, we will critique volunteerism, uh, and then we'll talk about the ways in which we can be productive as volunteers, as students, as people who maybe eventually are going to be politicians or uh, work for NGOs or work for governments and, and UNs and things like that. And so it's not to discourage people from doing that kind of work at all. It's to think more critically about what we're doing so that we can see more social change, more social justice. And so those will all be a part of the conversation. Sometimes, as Becky can attest, I'm sure it's uncomfortable sometimes because we don't brush anything under the rug. Uh, we are very open and honest about our own different social identities and we bring that right into our program and our experiences. And um, we're very raw and real with it. Uh, and then also hopefully productive, right? So it's not a space where uh, we're gonna talk about feminism and the men are gonna feel horribly like uncomfortable and can't sleep at night. No, that's not the point, okay? The point is to how can we help each other and build coalitions, okay? Across difference, between difference, and, and with each other. And we really do that also with our partners, okay? So you're gonna see in Ghana, there's different perspectives around slavery. 
and how to navigate those conversations. There's different ideas around religion and gender norms that you will hear everywhere you go, you know, and so that's part of that, that process and that conversation. Um, so can I talk about how it's set up? Yeah, can I add something really yeah. quick to that? Just because it's burning at the top of my head. One thing to recognize is that all of these conversations and skills and ways of thinking are directly applicable here. Um, yes. And so I just can't help but mention, so outside of Star Service and Study Abroad, um, I'm also an AD for Human and Common, so I work as a diversity consultant. So when we talk about these conversations of be it class, privilege, history, all these things that are rather taboo or you're not able to talk about on, you know, regularly, um, I spend so much of my time facilitating people and guiding those type of discussions because just because you don't talk about them doesn't mean that they go away. And especially if you're not from a country and you're there thinking that you're there to help, but you don't want to talk about anything that's too touchy, you're probably not going to be that helpful, right? And so just saying we both have different ways that we pull our experience and um, also the absolute reality that you can't be helpful if you avoid these conversations, but we pull it into a very um, in a academic, um, module you know and format as far as still classroom discussions and readings and activities and lectures which we have and all different types of things but just these are a lot of the topics addressed because they tie directly into stem and special education and public health right they're very relevant to the work you'd be doing yes so what we would do just to make it really clear <laughs> no it's <laughs> fine because this time, it's fine you can. okay it ties. so what we would do you would have two days where you're in the classroom and the classroom is literally part of the, the hotel that we stay in. Um, and so we're there. I'm the person instructing it. I print out all of the readings for everybody. So you're going to have some, some Collins and Audre Lorde. And then you're going to have some, uh, you know, news articles from Ghana related to the school or recycling or whatever policies you're learning about the local politics and economy. Uh, then we're gonna have some history. What was the one you just said? Oh, some Paul Farmer. <laughs> we'll talk about some structural violence and things. So even if you're not an anthropologist, I try to keep it like, we're, we're reading it and we're discussing it and it's accessible. Right. right. Some NPR, some videos, some Chimamanda Adichie, some Trevor Noah. Like we keep it, we keep it fine. Like I, I use a lot of different concept mapping and things and videos to make it accessible for everybody, no matter what your major is. And then we'll apply it to all of your different projects and, you know, just thinking critically is really what it's about. Uh, so that's for two days during the week. I think we did Sunday and Monday last year. And then you're with your um, project uh, managers three days a week, Roughly. basically. Don't right? quote us, but it's a, it's you get a lot of hours. You keep yeah. really busy, uh, and so then you'll you'll be doing your project at the site, uh, and then on the weekends we do excursions. So part of what you'll do is learn one of the main languages in this particular region, Chui. Okay, so that's really fun. We have a local school teacher come and teach you. It's not Eric anymore, but um, her name's Becky. Her name's Becky, <laughs> and she's really great. And so you'll have snacks. You'll learn how to have basic conversations. Maybe understand some of what people are saying to you. So even though every you know it's, English is a very common language, uh, depending on where you are, it's it's helpful to know some of the the chui. So we'll do that. Which is Fun. English is. It's a form, so, so Ghana is a former colony of Britain. Um, so there's multiple official languages. Yeah. English is technically the, the language of instruction in schools once you get past a certain grade. Uh, and then in the region, the central region where we would be, Chui is the most common after English. Yeah. Hausa. There's a lot of them, uh, hundreds, so. There's a lot. But those yeah. are the top three, yeah. yeah. Of course, we'll have guest lectures. So I do not claim ever to be an expert in Ghana. Um, the very first year, I was hesitant to even teach about Ghana, but we, we have started to tie in more news and uh, more 
different cultural understandings and things within the, the learning context with me, but we'll have guest lectures, whether that's, um, you know, practitioners, so maybe a traditional um, healer, uh, that could be a professor from the local university, uh, someone from the government, we've had different people come and speak to you guys, so you get a range of perspectives while you're there, you get to meet people uh, and see all of these different ideas and how it all comes together, all the complexities of a society. And there's Becky. So she oh, really Becky! was with us our first year there in the are. Greek grade. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. And do you remember who that is, that lecture? Yeah. Um, oh, no. That, oh. It's okay, it's not as, as late. No, 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 I know what, I can't explain it very simply, but he, Teaching about Ghana when he was like during his colonial era. Yeah, it was um, Chief um, Don Chi. He was giving a lecture on the culture of childhood and like kind of pre and post colonial. And then above that, we had Dr. Kofi Baku from the University of Ghana um, lecturing on the trade, the Atlantic slave trade from West Africa, which was very interesting because here we often hear from you know the other side of the story, so it was a different perspective. Yeah. I'm gonna let you. Okay. Come so with the what you'll see is that I'll do a lot of the education and networking things. Mia does a lot of the logistics, budgets, and spreadsheets. <laughs> and this next part is like my zone, her zone. <laughs> yeah. So um. As you know, so we are really are star service and study, half and half. You get the service, you get the study because they go together. Um, but when we're not in the classroom or we're not out working, um, we do have fun. And so we have some excursions because there is a lot of beauty to see in Ghana. Um, I can't get over this quote I heard or really came more so on my radar recently. And um, I just have to share it every chance that I get, um, which we had a teach in recently on decolonizing development work in West Africa at Mount Holyoke. Um, so anyways, but it's not exactly to this, but I still have to share it, is visit Africa for what it has, not for what it lacks. And so, so often when people think of going to Europe or something for study abroad, it's like just to, you know, eat pasta, take pictures, see the Eiffel Tower, have a good time. And often when it comes to going to Africa, it's like save people and help people. Um, so if you can't already tell, we're not really about that. Um, so obviously within the curriculum and the service work, we're building components of, okay, if you're going to do it, here's ethical ways, critical thinking to really apply to that. Um, but also we can't go to Ghana without appreciating all of the beauty that it has. Um, it's, it's one of my favorite, I mean, I don't go there to vacation, but after all of you leave and I get to have a weekend, it's one of my favorite vacation places. <laughs> um, so these are just some photos of some of the trips that we take. This is the Kakum. National Park. It's one of two, I believe, canopy walkways on the entire continent. So you're literally walking in the rainforest, in the, can the tree canopy. Um, and then, of course, for the sake of history, Ghana, um, one thing that um, Ghana is known for is the high uh, <coughs> concentration of slave dungeons that they have. So they're former European fortresses. They're often referred to as slave castles, but that seems very like a kind of oxymoronic, I don't know, slave castle. Um, but they're dungeons, they're holding cells, but then upstairs is where a lot of the, you know, fortresses and European traders were. Um, so Cape Coast is one of the places where they have two very large castles, so we also do visit that. And again, providing that historical context, we are there. Um, this was another photo of um, Senya, which is a nearby community, our base is in Kaswa, but um, this is Senya, which is a fishing community, and so I think Becky's year, um, this was a, an internship site actually, so this is what it really could look like when going out to do your, your internship work. Um, that's Ali petting an alligator. We don't endorse that. We don't pet alligators, but there was a moment we captured it. But again, there's a lot of cool stuff to see and do in Ghana. Um, I don't know why it says delete there, <laughs> but this is actually one of my favorite pictures, and I love being able to say it as we sit in the space that we're in right now. Um, I see a lot of UMass sweaters, so you know, UMass, this is the W.E.B. Du Bois Library. Um, but this actual room is the W.E.B. Du Bois Center, and um, 
I'm, I won't give a whole lesson on who he was because I think there's a lot of information around all of these walls to learn more that I, you know, it's better to absorb it from that. Um, but he was born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, and he's known as a huge Pan-Africanist and he's done a lot um, in the intellectual realm for Black people, Black rights, and kind of reconceptualizing Blackness in the U.S. and globally. It's really hard to put his work into a nutshell. Again, they dedicated a whole center to, <laughs> because of his legacy. Um, but he was born here in Massachusetts. This is the Du Bois Center here, and he died in Ghana. And again, he was a close friend of Kwame Nkrumah, um, the first president of Ghana, and so really just connecting that work as he did. Of course, we're nowhere close to that, but so in some ways we have that kind of Massachusetts Ghana connection. And so this is a photo taken from the W.E.B. Du Bois Center of his original collection of books. So I love books, so this is so cool to me that you can actually touch this history from this very important person. And then um, some other images. I guess you're really popular tonight, Becky. Um, but some other things that we do, we have art. There's a lot of very specific, just like in any country, you have some very specific art forms. And so um, wax prints and batik is one of them. Anywhere you go, you're going to see these vibrant fabrics. And so we have um, opportunities to workshop. And again, just doing fun things to kind of break up the work week. Um, drumming and dance, and then this is also um, from the capital city and seeing monuments and things of that sort as well. And now we're just going to jump abruptly into our talks. Yeah, so I guess all that good stuff doesn't come for free, unfortunately. Maybe not the best transition, but um, also out of respect of everyone's time, as you can see, we're running through all the information, then we're going to open it up for questions. Um, so, moving right over to cost, um, I don't, first and foremost, I'll share a little bit of trivia. We've been doing a lot of trivia and events lately. Um, so, the average study abroad program is about $6,000 for four weeks. So, that averages $1,500, and that's not very acceptable to most people. And so, study abroad in general, you know, just being able to put your life on pause to go to do something else that isn't working or studying in general isn't very accessible to people. But when you really look deeply into the industry, there's a lot of concerns that we had, um, not just on a grassroots level, how people are engaging with communities, but also on a capitalist corporate structural level, um, the amount of money that's in the volunteerism industry as well as the study abroad industry and how that perpetuates it not being accessible and not being diverse, right? And people not being considered within organizations, so then it's no surprise that their projects aren't very considerate of the people outside of the organization. Um, so we spent many, many, many months, this is where my spreadsheets come in, um, to try to make it as affordable as possible without compromising the experience. Um, yeah, and I think part of it is that we don't make six figures but because we want you to come and be able to come. And so our cost is $2,985, so it's slightly under $3,000. One thing when coming up with this figure that we also kept in mind um, is funding and what that looks like for a lot of college students. So I know very specifically for Smith and Mount Holyoke, there's the Praxis funding or the Link funding, and they usually give grants that are like three to $6,000 for summer internships. And you have to have a certain amount of hours too. So we structured our program to satisfy the hour requirements for most grants and internships, and then also to meet the cost that you would likely be awarded from a grant. So that's one thing that we tried to work within. Um, and so that includes your housing, your meals, your classes, all your activities, your daily transportation, and a weekly stipend. So basically once you land in Ghana, you're covered. And our program, um, if I fail to mention, is actually six weeks. So when I gave the statistic about the average of $6,000 for four weeks, ours somehow managed to be half that, but two weeks longer. I don't know. We can ask the questions to those corporate CEOs what their math is looking like. But again, this is for six weeks. Everything you eat, everywhere you go, that weekly stipend, we try to level the playing field too with spending money. Because um, I've been in study abroad programs where everyone was not going out as much as everyone else and you know not buying all these gifts and just money and stuff we just want to level the playing field so everyone can be focused on the work that they're there to do 
Um, and so um, I will just say, because it's not on the slide, um, but as with most study abroad programs, the plane ticket is not included. And then also when it comes to visas and vaccinations, passports, some people have a passport, some people don't, so that's not something we can account for. Vaccinations, some people have health insurance where it might cost $30, some people don't, it might be 300. We can't account for any of those things with the third party, so those things are not included in our fees. But again, once you land in Ghana, everything is covered. Um, so as far as funding your travels, and again, we're gonna have a Q&A, so any specific questions, um, we can definitely get deeper into this. But um, first and foremost, speak with your advisor because every school has different opportunities, but we highly recommend that. But again, if you are a Smithy or Mount Holyoke student, you can also talk to me and I feel like I have a lot of, I hustled that system when I was there. <laughs> yes, please. Please raise your hand if you're a UMass student. Okay, thank you. So, I'm also at UMass, and I just want to speak about UMass. So whether you go with us or whether you go do something else with whatever, any other organization or travel. Um, so speaking to your advisor, because most of our departments have some sort of funding for students, you just have to be creative with it. The social and behavioral, um, SBS, Social and Behavioral Sciences, they do have funds. Uh, one of our students, was it from last year or the year before? Tiara. Tiara, oh man, Tiara last year. She's an anthropology major. Public, public health. Public health. Yeah. Whew, she got so much money through UMass, through so many different <laughs> avenues. I will pick her brain more, but I know that the anthropology department, SBS, yeah. I don't know about IPO, but she, she, I don't think spent any of her own money. Yeah. She got it all through different scholarships and funding things through the university. So you do have to be a little creative, a little scrappy. Uh, we've also had students who have completely fundraised all of their stuff, you know, so no matter where you go or what you do, you can, you know, GoFundMe is really popular, but um, there's also places like the Legion and rotary Eagles, rotary clubs yeah. they'll fund different things like this so we ourselves don't offer credit i know that's coming up um so i know some of you might be relying on financial aid for the summer so you need to get like six credits in order to get financial aid we'll talk about that in a minute uh, but just thinking about fundraising and scholarships and things mm -hmm. there's money don't let them fool you oh, so God, if one yeah. person says no go to somebody else <laughs> yeah. And then the, for the journalism major, you can get de facto credit. Like I did a yes. different internship this past summer and I just got credit yes. for it. So Which I actually advocate for, and we're going to go on a tangent about that in a second. We yeah. have a whole slide for that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yes. Thank you for I, that. And um, yeah, definitely. I mean, between myself and Brittany both having navigated the undergrad university system, coming from working class backgrounds, um, I know we know how to get money from these institutions, the ones that we give money to. Um, and then also other students who we've worked with in more recent years who are more close in your positions to different majors. Um, I think we have a lot of information to offer, so reach out because we really do. I mean, even if you share a link with us, we donate, we share it with our families and stuff, and they're happy to, you know. So in big and small ways, reach out because we're happy to make this possible however we can, and we try really hard to be very accessible. Um, and so, but also, yeah, speaking with your advisor, and when we talk about the credits more too, just recognizing different experiences with different, different majors and stuff. Um, so getting to the credits, um, so as mentioned, we do not offer credits for our program. And first and foremost, I might really just be repeating myself in so many different ways, and I think you can really get a sense of who we are and our values from this, but we don't give credits for a very specific reason. And again, trying to maintain the affordable and accessible, when we give credits, we would have to triple or quadruple our funding. So you're actually paying more for the credits to go to a university, for that money to go to a university, than the money that you give us that could go to a community. And so we haven't been able to resolve or make peace with our program being $10,000 and several going to the university. It just seems like it's kind of counterintuitive. Um, and so that's the biggest reason is if you offer credits, you increase the cost. However, we do recognize that there is a really big benefit 
and being able to have credits because then you can get financial aid, you can get a loan, and it offers you more methods to make this possible. So for those of you who are interested in getting credits for this experience, um, Becky just mentioned having had experience with this where you can do a fall independent study. So we do, that's the first thing we recommend. So you go, you do the work, you're with us in Ghana, and then of course we've been in contact in the past with like advisors and professors. We have a syllabus, we have all this information. Um, so we communicate with them about what you did, and then in the fall you do an independent study around that. Um, and then you get credit for that, but it's still building off of the work that you just did. Um, so fall independent study, would you like to say more about that one? Well, so with independent study, let's say you're wanting to get financial aid or you really want summer credits for whatever reason. I understand that UMass has a whole thing about like you have to have so many credits. Oh, it's different than when I was an undergrad, which is fine. Um, so if you, if you really need summer credits, all right, uh, at least six credits, I think, for financial aid is how it works. I can absolutely share the syllabus and the curriculum with your advisor, all right? So the first thing you should be doing is speaking to your advisor and speaking to me and putting us in contact with each other. And do six credits as an independent study through your department because then you're getting whatever your major is, uh, an engineering independent study or something of that sort and I can work with your professor there's not like hundreds of students doing this program it's not unreasonable for me to work with you all one-on-one -on -one. <laughs> okay so so you can still do the independent study option uh, you can also do internship credits so if you go to the internship office um, at UMass which I think is in is it still in I don't, know. I don't, I don't understand instructions. We didn't have that at Mount Holyoke. So when you do an internship, <laughs> you can get uh, academic credit instead of, you know, and you can actually get paid for doing internships too, I learned. Mm -hmm. But um, you can get internships through the internship office here on campus. And I don't know where it is with all the construction. Um, so one yeah. thing with that too, I don't think anyone said they were a business major, but just as an example, um, I know the Eisenberg School, they give out internship credits. We have a contact list in there um, where you could easily get three credits or so for this experience for you know summer programs of the sort. And so that kind of brings us into also talking about the differences between departments. And so the um, differences between departments and recognizing that all credits might not be applicable to your major. And so that's another thing just to be conscious of, again, whether or not you're with us or going with any organization, sometimes they can have credits, but maybe if you're an engineering major, having a bunch of anthropology credits might not really help you to graduate any sooner or check anything off. And so um, that's just something, again, to be mindful of. And it's another reason why um, we say go work as closely as you can with your department and then with us as well. Um, and I think that covers it as far as credits. And again, we'll open it up for some questions soon. And so um, with all that said, you heard about the service, you heard about the study, and then all the fun stuff that we do in between, the cost, the credits, and then at the end of this whole program, some of the takeaway and the value, again, this could be resumes, CVs, and also just for your own personal growth and skill building. Um, you absolutely will gain research skills, um, whatever project you're working with, leadership skills as well. Um, I'll just tie that into saying too, I think we do a good job balancing um, guidance, support, and mentorship. Because again, from our origin story, it's important that people have some type of orientation before they get on a plane and go somewhere else. But we're not holding your hand the whole time because we also recognize that you're young adults and we respect your kind of independence and autonomy in that way. So something that's really cool too, compared to, I actually also studied abroad in South Africa, and I was with the same people every day from like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. in a room this big. Love some of them, <laughs> but that was a lot. Um, but because we have the three different projects, like if this was the classroom, half of the week you would be, you know, maybe you'll take a bus or you'll take a taxi or you'll walk to your internship site. So there's that level of independence, you know, as far as going and coming. Um, and so then when we say leadership skills too, that's kind of tied into that, again, recognizing, you know, young professional, these are all important things to be able to practice. Um, and yeah, professional development, be it dress, be it communication, and you'll find a lot of overlap. 
whether you're working domestically or internationally, it's just really good to be able to have some practice with some skills, that uh, professional skills. Um, absolutely building an international network and community. Um, I think that one speaks for itself, but as you can see, we're, we're here and our network is there and you're able to kind of tap into that and build that in a lot of different ways. And that can contribute directly to your thesis or any capstone projects that you're doing also can prepare you for graduate school. I think TR is applying to grad school as we speak and there's some, anyway, so sometimes there's these overlaps and a lot of aha moments as people are kind of in Ghana and they're also planning for their senior year and it can really inform that next step. And then of course, I think, I don't even know what number we're at as far as letters of recommendations. <laughs> we have lot. one student who's been on a roll, but again, thinking of that preparation for that next step, how that can be helpful. Um, increasing cultural, intercultural competency and knowledge. I guess we'll, yeah. Um, intercultural competence is always kind of a funny one because it sounds really good and more and more, especially in the field of diversity and inclusion, you hear it more often, but you actually can, there's no way to be competent in every single culture and to know all these different customs. <laughs> so it sounds good, but it's actually, you can't really practice it. Um, so we talk a bit about like cultural humility. And so whether or not, you don't need to know every single detail of every single culture to still have a level of humility to engage respectfully. Um, and not be very ethnocentric. And so, but I guess since we are functioning in a specific place being Ghana, we'll let it stand, but still just increasing that awareness, right? And engaging across differences in a meaningful way, making meaningful contributions to another community and everything, I, if you can't already tell, so much of what we do, you can completely apply it right here at home as you can abroad. Um, there's really no difference. The work that we're doing there needs to be done here, can be applied here, and you're probably going to spend more of your life here than there. So um, just a lot of value in many respects. And um, having a better understanding of international development, aid, and ethics. I think that just speaks for itself. <laughs> and so some nuts and bolts. Our application is due on March 15th at midnight. If it's 12.01, Okay, um, <laughs> but it is due just March 15th at midnight. Contact us in between. Again, we're accessible to any questions. And there's our website, starservicesstudy.com, our email, and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Um, there's also a mailing list around there that I'll ask you all if you're interested to, to pass around. Um, though I will say that mailing list is great but we definitely post on Instagram a lot more than we send out newsletters. So that's probably a more ideal way if you just want to kind of keep up or maybe if you're not even sure yet, but you want to just see what we have going on, I would recommend that. And finally, a quote that we always like to end on is from the Dalai Lama. And he says that our prime purpose in life is to help others. And if we can't help them, at least don't hurt them. So we're trying, <laughs> minimizing harm. So um, at this point, we're going to open it up for some questions and answers. And we have two alums in the room, Nathaniel, who we've already spoke about a few times, and then Becky's here as well. And so Nathaniel's background is engineering. Becky is public health. Journalism. Journalism. Anthropology. Jeez. Yeah, but all the things. <laughs> and, um, human trafficking. You did human trafficking when you were there, yeah. But they're both UMass students. And so um, and I'm glad that people caught on. We have a bunch of these extra flyers, so I just thought keep them as scrap, use them as scrap paper, and then take some to your roommate or whatever. Keep those. So we're just going to open it up to some questions and answers now. Yeah. Or did we cover everything? <laughs> Go ahead. Let's yes. hear. And can we hear your name? Yeah, my name is Amber. Were you at the fair? Yes. yes. We met before. No. Thank you so much for asking that. Yes. Um, yeah? Can I go for it? You go for yeah. it. <laughs> so I can't say accessibility enough. Study abroad should not be limited to just a few people. Everyone has something to give and everyone has something to get. Um, when uh, 
Becky was actually there with our first year. We had a participant who was 56 years old. Um, she was a Francis Perkins student um, from Mount Holyoke, but we have no age restriction. We don't have, you don't even have to be in college, even though where we work out of, that's most common. Um, but you do, you just have to pass a federal background check. Um, because again, you're not going to go to a community to work with children without having a quarry check, just as you would here in the States. But that's another issue related to volunteerism that we'll get into a lot more if you travel with us. Um, so we have a federal background check and you do have to be over 18. But other than that, cousins, friends, parents, professionals, you know, engineers, mechanics, whoever in between. Um, again, everyone has something to give and learn. And so along that vein, you would, we ask for your transcripts. There's no GPA, yeah. um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's not merit-based. Yeah, yeah, it's not merit-based. But we just want to see what you've done, what your interests are. You can usually tell by someone's electives and things, you know, and so it sort of helps us place people accordingly. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. All right, so um, for the classroom um, like there aren't like grades huh are there grades no okay. no if I try to keep it um more conversation based I don't really lecture a whole lot so we'll do the videos we'll have watched readings we'll do some concept maps try and keep it fun and try and figure out what the heck's going on in in our daily mm -hmm. lives <laughs> and, and you know think about our identity and stuff so we get to do that yeah The, this year, June 15th, I believe. I want to just pull up the website now to double check. But I believe it's June 15th to the end of July. Yeah, end of July. So it's six weeks from, is June 15th a Monday? No, it's fine. The 15th is a Monday. Yes, yeah, so we always start on Mondays. So June 15th is in six weeks from then. And I don't want to give you an exact date, but it's totally on the website. Every year we go around the same time. So the days like, might be two days off. So I don't want to say the wrong thing. We'll meet you there June 15th for sure. Any other questions? So our capacity is 20. And um, we usually have around a dozen, several. Yeah, it just depends. Yeah, it depends on the on the year. Yeah. Well, acceptance rate is hard because we don't want to turn people away because it's a pretty safe and, and secure. Like we keep everything unlocked so you can't really mess up a whole lot <laughs> um yeah but yeah so so we are asking also for um recommendations this year of course too just to be mindful yeah. of can i reframe that actually sure. so acceptance rate i always think of like that's a measure for seeing competitiveness yeah. into an institution so we haven't been asked that before no, we're like totally stumped um it's not but so much acceptance yeah like you're being judged <laughs> exactly mm -hmm. and so it's really more of just a fulfillment of basic requirements again that background check and age requirement and application so we know about you why you're wanting to come and um and then if you're able to meet those things i think more more often than not more so than us rejecting people is people who aren't able to come because of their own like life or logistical reasons you know um so i just wanted to like kind of rephrase that and step away from it because it's really not our approach it's like oh we're gonna take this like you know very fine crop of young people and all these people can't go you know it's like again everyone has something to give and get and if you're not doing it with us you're probably going to go with another organization and recognizing kind of the corporate ways of this huge industry we hope you go with us you know and oftentimes people who do these type of programs like myself who's been a part of many international programs around human rights or development and stuff once you start you keep going you know or people end up wanting to work for the un or whatever and so we just are very hopeful that if this is kind of the start or somewhere you know when you're starting off thinking about these things the next thing that you do will be more informed and ethical and you'll be able to kind of recognize when things aren't right you know so that's our that's our hope. Yes. Is it possible 
It's mandatory, um, but this sounds like this might be a very personal scheduling matter. This sounds specific, like there's a birthday on the 16th or something. <laughs> so we can definitely talk about that more after. Um, but in general, there's a real flow to what we have. Every day while we're there is very intentional. Um, there's work to be done, there's things to learn, and there's fun to be had and bonding with the group. And so someone kind of missing those first couple days or stuff can be really, you know, it's it's not ideal um but again situation just come talk to us and we're happy to see what we can work out did you have a hand no oh okay any further questions so for the people who came in in the middle did you guys need us to recap anything yes but i don't want to make like everyone stay okay yeah. okay <laughs> thanks yeah no that's great so go ahead and stay here yeah. in a minute yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. It's not like a hotel like you would experience. Yeah. In Amherst. Yeah. Though there is a pool. There is a pool. <laughs> so it's not the Sarabop either. Oh. Yeah. So um, our accommodations. Um, so for the bulk of our stay in Ghana, we're in Kaswa, which is about Google Maps will say it's an hour outside of Accra. Real traffic time is like two hours, two and a half, depends on what time you leave. Um, so we're in Kaswa, and so it's, I, there's a lot of different names. I think it's a little bit more British possibly, but like a guest lodge might be how you, you know, it's referred to, or a hotel. And so um, it is one single property that we all stay on. And so you have, you know, all your different rooms, and then we have a conference room upstairs. And so that's where we have, you know, our projector and our whiteboard and everything. So we're able to meet upstairs, and there's like a cafeteria, a restaurant downstairs too. And so you're able to kind of eat and sleep, and you know, then there's an outside garden area. Um, but we do stay together. I know a lot of programs do homestays. Um, for a list of reasons we don't do, they can be very distracting to the work you're doing when you have. 15 people were staying with 15 families multiplied by mom, dad, baby, like 90 people and drama. And it can really just distract from what you're doing. Um, and so we stay together on a single property and then even it's similar when we go on different trips and things of the sort. Um, but yeah, just being together just makes things a lot easier. And I, it's likely we might be kind of the only guests there too. So thinking of like hotels, it's not a bunch of people checking in and checking out, you know, it's, it's comfortable. They're really, they're really nice too. Yes. For like actual rooms, like would you be living with someone? Yes. So it's usually two to a room. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much it. <laughs> and, um, and that's something you also see in the application that we take into consideration too, is like, um, do you smoke? Do you drink? Do you need the lights off? Do you need the lights on? You know, and so we're not perfect matchmakers or anything, but we try to be conscious of people have different, you know, daily patterns and habits and stuff, but it is two to a room and then there's always ways to kind of switch it up as well. You know, halfway through, we might just want everyone to have a new room. You know? Again, we've studied abroad. We've been in enough programs to think of like, that would be really cool right now. Someone just waved a wand and we all got to make a new friend, you know, so. <laughs> Becky and Nathaniel, do you guys want to share? So Nathaniel is on the most recent in the STEM project. Do you want to share any things that surprised you or things you think people should know about the program? Um, I have a project that I'm doing with them. Um, they give me a bunch of old people over there. We didn't pay him either, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> we only offered him pizza and, and 
Becky, you were on our first year, and at the time we were doing an anti-trafficking project, which project with Triple Hearts, which we're not doing right now, but you can talk about the research and stuff. Yeah, like so mostly what I was doing was um, was interviewing, ethnographic interviews. So I went out with an interpreter, John, who's also my age, and he's been studying at the um, University of Ghana in Accra. And so we would go out when it was our days to work together, and we go and we, you know, interview people, and the tree was really helpful. I mean, I, you know, I was really <laughs> she was, she was on fire. fire. <laughs> she was <laughs> the neighbors. <laughs> oh yeah, well, also I would talk to a lot of people in the neighborhood, but um, yeah, so I was, you know, conducting a lot of interviews, which was it was really nice to, you know, like meet people that you're interacting with, um, and then I would bring the data back enter it for cheerful hearts to use for you know like creating you know for presenting you know pot you know policies that the US government will enact or like meeting with the US embassy to you know push the Ghanaian government to do you know to enact certain policies that would actually help the people. And um yeah I definitely hung out with people like I used to have did you ever see like the trail of kids who would follow me to work? Yeah <laughs> <laughs> like oh they're so sucky <laughs> um, <laughs> The ducklings. <laughs> yeah, well, also, um, I'm white and I would speak to me really badly, and so the, all the kids thought it was really funny. So they'd follow me around saying, A broody. A <laughs> broody, a broody. Yeah. Yeah, and we'd ask them to speak to me, and I'd say, and they'd start laughing, and they'd say it again. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, like, you're in a, Yeah, like the independent, like, even though you're in, you know, like, Star service and study, it's really important to be out in the community because you're doing community work. So it doesn't mean like just interacting with the community when you're supposed to be on. It means like actually being out there and you get to learn what life is like. And like as a woman, I felt pretty safe too. So if you're worried like walking around at night, like I used to walk everywhere and I would do a lot of stuff by myself. And when we were in Accra, I one day I was like, oh, I'm just gonna go on a tow road, which is like a bus. And I started talking to the women on the bus, and then I just spent the rest of the day with one of the women. She's like, I'll show you around. So she's like, this is where my mom works. She works in the post office and post office, which is a neighborhood, a got a neighborhood. This is the lighthouse. This is the fence. This is where, this is where I didn't even work. know about this adventure until now. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so I just have a first Show you around and sure. I, I think two great things that you just highlighted <laughs> is one you have independence we're not big with too much hand holding and also identity you can't avoid it that's why we talk about it in the classroom because even on the street it'll be pointed out yeah. <laughs> did you make new friends while you were there too yeah. some drivers and people Do you, I mean, just ask real quick, do you have a similar question? I think you walked in around the same time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Does anyone else have a similar question or do they feel like they have a sense of that? Okay. We can hold off for one yeah. second yeah. and get any of the other questions. Yeah. But the fact that it was on a flyer, it means something to us. So yeah. if anyone who was already here didn't get the message, I wanted to make sure yeah. we took yeah. that time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. No, yeah. we're happy to elaborate in price sure. for anyone else. <laughs> so let's take 10 seconds. Did anyone have other burning questions? So you're welcome to stay and we're going to answer that. Um, or if you're done, you have all the info you need, you're welcome to leave, you know, so you, it wouldn't be, you know, inappropriate, but let's totally get into that.